Prime Time from New York continues. Once again, Diane Sawyer. While we were in Moscow last week touring the Kremlin, we realized that we were about to witness a kind of cultural milestone. Six days from now, a new establishment will be open for business there. And as you'll see, open after years of negotiating, setbacks, and hope. It's a cultural milestone because we suspect the Soviets are about to learn what Westerners have known for years, that political systems come, political systems go, but junk food is forever. So there you are in Moscow, looking at the timeless beauty of St. Basil's, or scanning the Stalinist spires nearby. When, wait a minute, roll back that tape. Look there, in the corner. They're coming. No, they're here. McDonald's? No. Big Mac? No. Not everyone knows that in the last year, this building in Pushkin Square has become the restaurant about to eat Moscow. The biggest McDonald's in the world. 700 seats inside, 200 outside. They're gearing up for 15,000 customers a day. You might think you were in Poughkeepsie or Des Moines until you walk up to the counter. You see, the Russian language has no H, so you have to order a Gamburger with your chocolate milk cocktail. I think the reaction from the, uh, from the Soviets is going to be exceptional. I think they're going to just say, thank you, thanks, McDonald's, thanks for coming here. George Kohan is president of McDonald's of Canada. His company made the $50 million investment after his superhuman persistence won the deal. It took him 14 years under four Soviet leaders. You'd have an all-day negotiation. At the end of a long day, you'd agree on something. You'd come in the next morning, and there'd be a whole new team of negotiators people you'd never seen before. When Kohan and his team finally got underway, they discovered early on that the Soviets have constant beef shortages, and what there is has too much fat. So two years ago, they brought in experts to beef up a herd that would be raised solely for McDonald's. And the French fries. Soviet potatoes are plentiful, but so small the fries would have been microscopic. So McDonald's brought in the seed for its own long russet Burbank potatoes. They're growing them on two farms outside Moscow. This 100,000 square foot plant turns out to be a kind of farm away from home. They make the apple pies here. Soviet apples are so bad this year, they had to import these from Bulgaria. And don't expect any tomatoes in the Moscow McDonald's. Soviet tomatoes are as rare as jewels. But soon they'll be turning out 800,000 hamburger buns every week and tons of cheese. They take this mild white cheese, heat it with food coloring, and as quickly as you can say dosvidanya, turn it into the familiar American processed kind. What do you think Lenin would have thought of McDonald's in Moscow? I think he loved it. <laughs> he loved it. All right, the question all America has been waiting for. Can I try something? Can I try a French fry? Yes. All right. I have to tell you the truth. Yeah. They're better. It's one thing to recreate McDonald's food, another to introduce Western-style service. Yet this store is full of well-educated, multilingual, beautiful Soviet kids. Scrubbing floors, wiping machines, desperate to pass the test. Back in the States, a kid kind of takes a job at McDonald's for granted. Not so here. It's the answer to an upwardly mobile dream. When the Moscow McDonald's announced 600 positions were available, 28,000 people applied. These kids are being paid two rubles, about 30 cents an hour, with capitalist incentives and benefits, which means they make more than a Soviet doctor will make. No wonder they're struggling to get it just right. This is a hamburger drill team. Since food is scarce, they practice with cardboard, bun, lettuce, burger, bun. They even practice the bag roll. No, no, you roll backwards, away from the top. And they practice a skill that Muscovites may find the most shocking of all, politeness. 
saying hello and thank you. Everything is very dynamic. Everything is very f fast, maybe, or quick. And, um, and everybody is smiling, and I like it uh, very much. Because in the Soviet restaurants, you won't see it. And sure enough, across town at a typical Soviet restaurant, the waiter takes a cigarette break while on duty. In the kitchen, a little rest before ladling out the stew. Minutes later, the waiter is still puffing. Even so, there's one thing that may keep people from tearing over to McDonald's. In a lot of Russian restaurants, you can eat a whole meal of meat, potatoes, soup, and bread for about the same amount, 30 cents, as you pay for a Big Mac alone. And yet, look at the most crowded shops in Moscow these days, Estee Lauder, and down the block, Christian Dior. There's clearly a curiosity and an appetite for luxury. McDonald's just hopes that includes luxury on a bun. We're not gonna build one restaurant or two or three. We're gonna build 20, then 30, then 50, then 100, then thousands. So it may be that the Russian people fought off the Tartars and Mongols all those years, only to capitulate to burgers and fries. And don't be surprised if someday Russian children study a sign like this and wonder why they made that cathedral in honor of a Sunday. A financial footnote now. In the beginning, the profits are gonna be small, but they'll be divided this way. The Soviets are gonna get 51%, McDonald's of Canada, 49%. But here's the hitch. Those profits are in rubles and can only be spent in the Soviet Union. If McDonald's wants hard currency, it has to sell Russian-made ingredients abroad. This has been a